Hello. Welcome to this edition of the Academy. Today we're going to continue our look at Sun Tzu's Art of War, Chapter 6, about strong points and weak points. And today the focus is more on uh, concepts of deception. Now, this isn't necessarily deception in the grand scheme of things where you're, you're trying to hide uh, your forces from the opponent, or you are trying to hide your intentions, uh, or you're trying to make certain intentions apparent to deceive your opponent to take an action that allows you to actually do what you want to do in the first place. So that's what we're trying to do. <clears throat> I guess the best way to say what this is not <clears throat> is to think back to World War II and the deception the Allies used as they created the dummy army under Patton in Britain, for making the Germans believe through all of the radio traffic, through all of the false orders that were created, even the planted documents, there was this invasion army ready to go across the Paz de Calais, that knuckly. None of it was there. It was, none of it was real. That's a grand deception about your intentions and the grand scheme. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a more tactical turn-by-turn -turn kind of deception. Uh, and not, not even your, your strategy deception, but trying to achieve your immediate goal through some sort of misdirection. So let's look at what he's trying to say here. Uh, we're only going to cover uh, sentences basically 9 through 12. That's really all that we're going to cover. Uh, so let's just begin. O oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy, though you, through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible. And hence, we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. You may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points. You may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. If we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement, even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart or a deep ditch. All we need to do is attack some place or some other place that he will be obliged to defend or relieve. <clears throat> if we do not wish to fight, we can present or prevent the enemy from engaging us even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground, all we need to do is throw something odd or unaccountable his way. Very interesting sentences, especially that last one. So let's kind of walk through them. Uh, sentence nine is just uh, being very flowery, talking about how you know, subtlety and secrecy is so important. Now, in here he's talking about, we learn to be invisible and audible, what literally the Chinese actually translates uh, without form or sound is really what, it's, what it means. Um, but this is with reference to the enemy, so essentially it's without the enemy being aware of through visual or audible uh, means, or modern, any radar or other intelligence, not aware of what our movements are. That's and again, this is very tactical. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Now, the next sentence is, you may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points, which is the whole point of this entire chapter. The key here is, as we talked about previously, is identify where the opponent is weak, and that is where you want to attack. If you have placed your strength against his weakest point, or a weak point, you will be much more successful and you'll, you'll be able to accomplish the goal in front of you. That's what he's trying to remind us here in the sentence. But here's one of the things that, uh, you know, your, your opponent isn't going to play nice with you. They're not going to give you that weak point all the time. So there's a couple ways to deal with that. So sentence 11, he actually talks about, well, if we wish to fight the enemy, uh, but he's, he's, in this case, behind a ditch or a rampart, essentially a defended position. You don't want to attack him. That's a strong point, not a weak point. So you need to figure a way to get him out of there. Now, a lot of our recent military history has shown generals deciding, oh, the way we're going to make the opponent move is to just bombard that position and force him to move, force him to clear out. It has not really been effective. Uh, Monte Cassino... Probably one of the best examples I can think of off the top of my head. The Germans had a, had positions up in the monastery. It's debatable how many positions, but there were still there was there were they were present. They had artillery spotted up there for sure. They had a solid defensive position, although it probably wasn't well 
held at the time. And what do we do? Well, force them out of there by bombing it. All we did is convert this well laid out monastery, a historical landmark basically, into a city ruined landscape, which gave the Germans plenty of places to hide and set up fields of fire, observational positions, and they were much harder to pull out of that, force out of there. And the only way we tried to force them out again was the frontal assault. All because no one had thought about a means to basically make that particular position pointless. Sun Tzu would have argued that don't go against it, don't fight that, don't attack that, don't bomb it. Find a way around it. Find a way to attack something else to force that unit to realize the position is not really important anymore. In fact, they need to go relieve something else. <clears throat> so that you can do that here on, the, on our tabletops all the time. Your opponent's in a, in a well-concealed, well-covered, hidden behind, or inside a building, some place that makes it harder for you to get at him. Well, threaten him in such a way that he has no choice but to really pull that unit out. Expose him, maybe not expose him perfectly, but at least he's more vulnerable than where he was. And that allows you to attack him on more equal terms. Or basically, removes his strong point, replaces it with a weaker point. Hopefully, a very weak point. Okay. Now, sentence 12 <clears throat> actually uh, is the flip side. Situation where you, you have a weak point, and your opponent has a strong point, <clears throat> and you are really worried about them actually coming in and doing something about that. <clears throat> well, in his particular example here, he's talking about... Uh, deceiving the opponent to thinking that your weak point is actually very strong. And he doesn't tell you how to do this, he just tells you that's what you need to do. And his illustration is basically that you have made it look like you have an encampment. You probably see the fire rings and the, some tents here and there and some equipment, but your army's not there. But the opponent can see your encampment. And through various trickery that you provide, you convince them that this encampment is represents a larger force and has a strong position and they're, they're just not going to want to attack. Now, what's really interesting is the commentators have really enjoyed going after this uh, and ex explaining this and giving us examples from uh, their current history uh, back when they were writing. So, uh, there's one uh, Tumu, uh, I believe is how you pronounce his name. I'm going to read a couple examples here. Uh, he gives us a couple of illustrations from his time period, and one of them is, uh, I hope I can get these names right though, uh, Chuko Lang. Uh, he was uh, occupying uh, Yangping and uh, was about to be attacked by, uh, oh boy, these are good, <laughs> Suma Yi. <laughs> uh, and he was not in a position to really defend well. He, he knew he was outnumbered. He was, he was in a weak position. His opponent was stronger. He was about to be attacked. So he was behind walls. Uh, and now normally that's a strong position, but he knew better. <clears throat> he was smart enough to assess his position. He realized it was, it, he, had to, he was in no position to really put up enough resistance to win. So what does he do? He strikes his colors which basically means pull, pulls on the flags, makes it look like he's gone. He flings open the gates, uh, leaves them wide open to the enemy, and the only thing the enemy can see are a few weak, if ill or injured, stragglers. No sign of the rest of his forces. Well, the opponent, it, it actually has the intended effect, because what the opponent immediately does is he thinks, this is a trap. Because who in their right mind is going to let all the guard defenses down and let the attacker just walk in, right? Unless they had something in mind. So the opponent doesn't even bother attacking. They just basically retreat. They break off and, and move a different, different way. No battle. He survived because of that deception. He made himself look strong because of this deception of, I have a trap laid for you, even though he really didn't. And he was able to secure that victory, in that particular case, actually without a fight. Now, the tabletop, you can do exactly the same thing, uh, albeit you won't be necessarily uh, pretending your, your forces aren't there or that you have a trap, but one of the things you can do is, as the battle unfolds, 
and you find yourself in a situation where a part of your force or even your plan appears to be going poorly, you can, again, wisely, using some wisdom here, yield a part of the table to your opponent, allowing you to reinforce another part, you know, strengthen your own lines, and act like you got no, you got this. It's you're not worried. There's nothing, no problem at all. And then what's it's going to put some doubts in your opponent's mind. It'll make them maybe a little hesitant to take advantage of that weak spot that you just created to strengthen your other part of your line, right? Uh, <clears throat> one example I like to use. Uh, now I know this is a 40k specific scenario, but uh, I think it it illustrates the point fairly well. Uh, at least I hope it does. Um, and I'm not certain other game systems have a mechanic that would be similar that you could exploit, but it's it could be possible. So let me just just, just lay it out ahead of you. Here's what here's what I've got. One of my favorite um, combinations of units is a very fluffy uh, Tau list. Uh, matter of fact, I was playing it long before the new Codex came out. Essentially, it's all their it's it's the Piranha and the uh, Pathfinders, it's the scout, the recon units. Very weak, you know, in and of themselves. Uh, they're more of a support unit. They need backup, strong backup. But I like playing with them just because I like the story of here's the advance, the front, front, the what do you call it, vanguard, going out and engaging the opponent, finding the opponent, pinning them down, all that kind of stuff. Well, they just, in the, with the latest codex, created a special formation that gives you a neat little rule that allows you to if any one of the units within that formation, there's at least six minimum, then what happens is if that's any of those units dies, it's completely eliminated, immediately your next turn, all of your reinforcements in your army come on the board right away. There's no need to roll, no randomness to it at all. So what ends up happening is you can there's t I, I play this in two different ways. The first one is I put a very fragile unit on the table. And it worked. It, it, I'm going to play this through the whole way. Here's, this, this is an evolution. Uh, and it's, it's something you need, to, you need to kind of think about as you start playing this. The first time I brought it on, I explained the rule to the opponent, but the, rule, the opponent didn't really grasp the impact of the rule. And so I put this sacrificial unit out there, <clears throat> a very weak vehicle, very easy to destroy. And when he targeted it, I chose to not try to defend with anything special. And of course, it popped. And the very next turn, everything of mine came in. And I surrounded him. And it made his life very difficult. <clears throat> From that point forward, everyone in the, our game group knew about this move. So now... I do the same thing. I take this one fragile unit with a very dangerous armor weapon, anti-armor weapon, put it right in the front. Everybody knows what it can do if it gets destroyed. So now I have a weak unit that if it does get destroyed, allows me to bring in the rest of my forces. And if it is not dealt with, I essentially have free reign to go after their armor and potentially destroy units every turn. So again, using deception, the opponent never doesn't really know what which of those things I'm wanting to do, and he knows the risk that's involved. He has to make a decision. And so I I'm able to play this game, strong point, weak point. I've actually been able to turn it I have a weak what appears to be a weak point. He doesn't really know where to attack if that's the only thing on the board. Because he doesn't want to make a position and his lines that allows me to come in and take advantage of those empty spaces that he made. He can't attack it without risking envelopment. So he's not certain where to attack. If I put a very strong, uh, and I've done this one before, uh, even using that one weak unit, I put a strong uh, fort fortification, kind of a small position, with some good strength, some hitting power behind it, and that's something the opponent can actually go after. It's a strong point, but again, it's a strong point, so it's going to force him to use his strong 
units against it. There's not a whole lot of weak on the board except the one thing that actually is kind of a strength of mine with that special rule, right? So it, it's, he doesn't know where to attack, right? So that's how you can, you have to look at how does your opponent perceive what you have and then use those things that you've got to dissuade him from attacking or encourage him to, from attack, to attack, right? You, it's, it takes some practice and it really takes uh, some time to get to know your opponent. This is why it's hard to do in tournaments, but it's much more easy to do in casual play at your local store or local game group where you can learn how your opponent uh, likes to play and what gets him motivated or worried or cautious. So that's what Sun Tzu's trying to deal with here. Um, and again, it's all about practice. So, gee, we have another reason to play more games. That's a bad thing, huh? <laughs> so... Uh, I do challenge you to go out there and try to practice some of these ideas. Don't go, you know, for the everything. Don't try to be perfect at this or out of the gate. Just start applying the concept. Start imagining the ways you can deceive your opponent as to your immediate atten intentions uh, on the next turn, for example, the turn after that. It's kind of like chess. You try to mask from your opponent what you're really trying to do two or three moves down the board. Uh, here, it's all about the current turn and the next turn, right? So, all I want you to do here is just kind of try to think a little differently. Don't necessarily put it into practice right away, because it takes practice, right? But see if you can start thinking in those terms. Once you do, start applying it onto the tabletop. You might be surprised what you run into. So, um, that's the lesson today in a nutshell. Um, I hope it makes some sense to you. Uh, it is a lot more esoteric in that, in the sense it's, it's very hard to apply specific examples. You have to think more generally. And again, as referring to some of his earlier metaphors, it's very fluid. You know, as the seasons move from one to another and the weather changes, what have you, your situation on the tabletop will change. You have to be fluid in the way you see these opportunities for deceiving your opponent with your intentions, taking advantage of your your strengths, taking advantage of his weaknesses, covering your weaknesses, all that. It, it takes a lot of effort. So uh, give it a shot. Start practicing. Take it to heart. See what you can learn. Okay. If you have questions, please leave them below. I'll, I'll try to answer them in the comments. I may include some of those in a, a future video, especially if I see a pattern where there's a, may need to discuss a point more. Okay? Uh, share, like, and subscribe, and let your friends know about this, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.